today. I think I'll talk about the thing called prison. This should help us to understand the thing called life a bit better and will help us to understand Dhamma which helps us to live life without dukkha. We'll understand this better also. And so today we'll talk about the thing called prison. If we look carefully, we'll see that wherever there is the condition of imprisonment, that right there, is dukkha. We can see that all the forms and types of dukkha have a quality of imprisonment, imprisonment to them, being caught, captured, incarcerated, imprisoned in difficulties. This is the quality of dukkha. If you, under, if you understand this and understand what we mean by imprisonment, then you will understand the, since the symptom or situation which we call upadana. You'll understand this more clearly that wherever there is there is this condition of upadana attachment that there right there is this condition of imprisonment we can see that <clears throat> wherever there is upadana that right there are bonds and fetters. Sometimes these bonds have the nature of positive and sometimes they are negative bonds. But whether positive or negative, they still have the quality of, of tying up, of binding, of chaining. This happens through regarding things and then clinging to them as I and mind and mind. Then we are bound to them and from being bound to them, tied up with them, we get stuck in them, we get trapped in them, just like we can be trapped within prison. In Buddhism, there's the, the general or the all-inclusive principle that upadana, attachment, leads to dukkha. We can say that all dukkha comes from, arises from, is born from attachment. And so, we, if we're interested in being free of attachment or free of dukkha, we need to understand this matter of how dukkha comes from upadana. Understand how this upadana is just like a prison, a mental prison or a spiritual prison. we come to study Dhamma, we practice meditation or vipassana in order to end upadana. Or if we speak metaphorically, we study Dhamma and practice mental development in order to destroy the prison that traps us. 
This is a mental or spiritual prison which we're talking about. But it is pretty much, or it works just like the physical prison that people are getting, are being incarcerated in all over the place. But this one we're speaking of here is a purely spiritual prison. It's a bit strange or extraordinary in that we can't see it with our eyes. And it's even more extraordinary that people actually volunteer to stay in this prison. People are actually delighted to go and get caught in prison. This is a very queer aspect about this spiritual prison. We might think about the word salvation. All the religions teach about salvation or emancipation or whatever. In English, we could translate it in different ways, whether emancipation, liberation, deliverance, or salvation. But what's important is to correctly understand from what are we saved? From what are we emancipated? And the answer is the spiritual prison. Just like this thing that all of you desire, that all of you are looking for, this thing called freedom or liberty. It's essentially the same thing, whether we speak about physical freedom, mental freedom, or spiritual freedom. Those who are not very wise are terribly afraid of the physical material prison but those who look more closely and carefully into see, and in order to see things more profoundly will see which kind of prison is the most terrifying and most dangerous. Really, this physical prison, hardly anybody is caught in it. If we look around, there aren't that many people that are locked up in ordinary jail. But as for spiritual prison, we're all caught in it. Every one of us is trapped. Even as we sit here, we are incarcerated in the spiritual prison. Although we may not know it, we may not realize it, we may not even be aware of it for ourselves, this is the situation. And this spiritual imprisonment is what, what forces us, which, which pressures us to look for a way out. This is what drives us to be interested in, in Dhamma, to come to study Dhamma, to practice meditation, in order to find the spiritual freedom. Most people aren't aware of the spiritual imprisonment. But nonetheless, it's, it's driving all of us, it's pressing us, whether we realize it or not, to find a way out, to find spiritual freedom. This thing that imprisons us, this upadana, attachment or clinging, is just one, one thing. But this Attachment, this upadana, can take many forms. There can be many kinds of prison. And so if we take the time to look into these different forms of prison, then we will understand upadana better. And we will understand the dilesa, the defilement of mind which, which cause dukkha better also and we will understand dukkha itself. 
better too. And so we will study, we'll come, we'll come to understand these things more clearly by looking into this thing called prison. From now on, let's just use the word upadana or in Thai upadhan. Better to use the word upadana instead of the English word attachment because this English word is constantly being misunderstood. So let's be careful and just stay with the word upadhan or upadhana. It will be easier for us. Because this thing, upadhan, is the heart of Buddhism. All of Buddhism aims to get rid of upadhan, or to cut off upadhan, so that there is no more prison and no more dukkha. You should take the words, uh, the English words, attachment, and grasping, and clinging, and thinking, and all of these together can be, have the meaning of upatan or upadana. The word upadana is much broader and includes all those English words. Just one simple word, upatan, but it's the most important thing. It's the heart of Buddhism to, to uproot or to cut off this upadana. This is the heart of all Buddhism, no matter what sect or school. Theravada Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism, Zen Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism, whatever kind of Buddhism it is, they're different only in name or in the ceremonies or the external practices. But inside, it's all the same thing, cutting off upatan. Please don't be, be sad or disappointed or anxious that you haven't been able to study all the schools of Buddhism. I, we hope you're not disappointed that you haven't been able to go to study Buddhism in Sri Lanka, in Burma, in Tibet, in China, and everywhere. Please don't be sad about this, because if you just come, because to look at it that way is to understand only the surface or the skin, the, the outer covering of what seems to be different kinds of Buddhism. But the heart of the matter, the heart of all Buddhism, is the same everywhere. The uprooting, the cutting off of attachment. So just come and study this one thing. Just see this one thing. And then we will know all of Buddhism. We'll know all the different kinds of Buddhism. We'll know the heart of Buddhism, and so it won't be necessary to spend our time with superficial matters. If you want to, for example, learn about Mahayana Buddhism, then you'll have to go and learn Sanskrit, and you'll spend almost your entire life trying to learn Sanskrit, and you still won't really know anything. Or if you want to learn about Zen, then you have to go and learn Chinese and spend your whole life learning Chinese and then in the end you still won't know very much. Or if you want to learn about Vajrayana, then you have to learn Tibetan. And after you've spent your whole life learning Tibetan, you haven't really learned anything. This is just studying languages, studying the outer forms. If you really want to study these, these Buddhism, then it's not a matter of language, but studying just this one thing, upadana, 
and the cutting off of upadana. And then we don't have to worry about all these, these different forms of Buddhism where they've been improved or adjusted these new developments of Mahayana and Zen and Vajrayana. We can learn all of it whatever we, by whatever name it goes by learning this one thing, Upadana. Even in, even in what they call Theravada Buddhism, there are many different forms of, and there are many different kinds of, of meditation. There's the kind of meditation from Burma where they, they watch the rising and falling of the abdomen. There are people who use the phrase Sama Arahang, Sama Arahang, or others who use the, the mantra Puto, Puto, and all kinds of other different things. But if it's correct meditation, the heart of it is always in exactly the same place the cutting off of upadana. So let's not waste our time on the superficial matters. Let's talk about the, the prison, the jail, this upadana that is trapping us all. Really, to, to study this matter from the scriptures or from the different forms of Buddhism could never be truly successful. To really understand this thing successfully, we have to study it in itself. We have to study the actual upadana, the actual prison, the actual dukkha in itself. So please find, please look for and discover the actual thing, this prison, this this dukkha, and that's where we'll study. So this brings us to a, a distinction between two things. The first is external learning, and the second is internal, inner learning. The external learning is from books, ceremonies, outer practices, and things like that. The Buddha taught that the whole teaching that he has proclaimed has been taught in regard to this body, which is, which in, is inclusive of feelings and perceptions. That means a living, a living body, a body in which there is the living mind. And this, in this, this is where we can study these, study Buddhism. We can't really study it in the external books and ceremonies and practices. It can only be studied within. So let's study it there or here. This system of mental development called anapanasati, mindfulness <coughs> with breathing, which we have been tracking here, this is the kind of inner study, inner learning, which we are talking about. But to do this inner study takes a, a fairly good amount of patience and endurance. But not too much patient endurance. It just takes enough patience and endurance. But really, it's not that big of a deal. There are some things like some sports, gymnastics, acrobatics, and things, where it takes a tremendous amount of endurance, where people have to practice for years and go through great, great difficulties. And still people are willing to do that. To practice mindfulness with breathing correctly actually takes less endurance, less patience than that but still some people don't even have that amount of patience. And so they've, they've already left, they've already run away. But if we have enough in, endurance to get this far and to practice further, then we will receive the, 
the proper benefit. So please, apply yourself with patience and endurance to this inner study. To speak using metaphors makes it easier for us to understand the matter we're discussing. And so today, as we speak with you, we'd like to talk some more about this prison that we have mentioned. The first prison we'd like to talk about is life itself. Life itself is the first prison we'd like to mention. If you look at life and see it the way it really is, if you see nature as it is, then you'll see <clears throat> what a what a prison it can be. But very few people look at things carefully. Most people just look at life as, as an opportunity to have fun. And so they volunteer for this. And this, this volunteering, this willingly, this willingness to get into it leads to infatuation to indulging in the fun of life and through this infatuation this infatuation is the prison if we see the the prison of life this means that we have seen the attachment the upadana in life if we haven't really seen the upadana in life, then we won't see that life is a prison. Most people rather see it as heaven. If we don't see this upadana in life, then we, we tend to see it as heaven because there are all kinds of wonderful, pleasant, agreeable, attractive things in life. And when we see these, we take, oh, it's, it's heaven. But because of all these attractive, wonderful things, we, there tends to be upadana in these things. And the more attractive and wonderful they are, the stronger the upadana, and the more we are trapped, the more we are imprisoned by these things. These lovely, satisfying, attractive things lead to a positive kind of upadana and that kind of dukkha. On the other hand, the things that we hate, which, dist which we don't like, that leads to a negative kind of upadana. But whether it is positive upadana or negative upadana, it's a prison both ways. And that prison turns life into dukkha. Together with this, one will see that when there is upadana in life, then life becomes a prison. However, when there is no upadana, then life is not a prison at all. Then one should look at one's own life is there upadana or not? Is my life a prison or not? Am I living in prison, in upadana or not? Each of us should look very carefully into our own hearts and ask these questions and look for the answer. Otherwise, why are we coming to meditate? Why are we coming here to do this? The correct, the true goal and purpose of mental development is to destroy the prison. And so we, we need, if we're going to be practicing correctly, we need to see this prison and whether we're in it or not. 
most of us are not even aware of what's happening. Most of us don't even know that we are trapped in a prison. But once we begin to wake up and realize the prison we've made for ourselves, then we need to ask, what are we going to do about it? How are we going to get out of this prison? So the question, how are we going to be free of the prison we make of life? This is a question that we must answer very carefully and correctly. When we say, what are we to do so that life is not a prison? When we ask this question, it means that, or it implies that, ordinarily or naturally, life is no prison. But because of our own ignorance, our own stupidity, we go and turn life into a prison. Because when there is ignorance in life, then it causes upadana, and this upadana makes life, this upadana in life makes life a prison. In Thai, there's a phrase, som nam na, which means something like, it serves you right, you do, it serves you right. It serves life right, that when life is ignorant, it makes upadana and turns itself into a prison. It serves it right, because of its own ignorance. If one practices anapanasati correctly and earnestly, then one will come to understand upadana and life and the prison that we make of life. And then one will understand how to get rid of upadana in order to not turn life into a prison or so that any prisons that we have built will dissolve and disappear. This is what mindfulness with breathing is about in order to free ourselves of that prison. So we hope that you can understand this in order that you will apply yourself with energy, with endurance, in to the practice of mindfulness with breathing. Our lives, or we can say ourselves, must must proceed, must continue, must go on according to the law of nature. There's no way that we can get around this. Everything we do is subject to the law of nature. The fact that we must search for food, bathe, find clothing, build shelter, sleep, and all the other things there's no way we can get around these things. We're forced to do them by the law of nature. This is a prison. The fact that we have to follow the law of nature is a kind of prison. How are we going to break out of this particular prison? This living subject to the law of nature becomes a prison because of upadana. When we look at this in terms of I and mind, when we view it in terms of self, then all these things, searching for food, shelter, taking care of the body, all these things become a source of worry, anxiety, and fear. It's this 
the, this worry, anxiety, and fear which comes from upadana, this is what makes these things a prison. So if there's no upadana, then there will be no fear, no worry, and no anxiety about searching for food and taking care of the body and all the other things that the law of nature forces us to do. And so that law will not be a prison for us. This is a very subtle truth, a subtle natural truth, that it is upadana regarding this this matter which makes it into a prison. By remove, by dropping the upadana, then there is no prison. And we just do what needs to be done according to the law of nature without it being any prison. The next prison we would like to talk about are the things called the instincts. All life is subject or under the power of the instinct, and this this becomes a prison. All lives, especially human life, is subject to the instincts of fleeing from danger, finding food, and so forth. And these instincts become a prison. Most especially of all, the sexual instinct. This has great power over us, makes it us run around doing all kinds of things, makes us terribly tired to go through all kinds of difficulties because of the power of this, this instinct. We do all kinds of things. It disturbs us. It's constantly pushing us and making us do things because of its, its great power. A child is, is not under the power of this instinct. But as the child grows and reaches a certain age, then all of a sudden the sexual instinct ripens completely. And then the child is imprisoned, is born into the prison of this sexual instinct. What, what great, great hassle and difficulty it all becomes. Even the instinct of showing off can have tremendous power on us. Many people wouldn't think of this as an instinct, but all, all animals have it. Even this instinct of the need to, to show off, to brag, to display oneself, to claim, to, to show off that one is beautiful or handsome or talented or whatever. All the, all the fancy clothes, these beautiful shirts and trousers and shoes that we buy and, and fill our closets with. Or we sit in certain ways or comb our hair in certain ways and worry about our beards and our earrings and all these, all these crazy things because of the instinct to show off. And because it's, this instinct is so strong, it's always squeezing us, pushing us, forcing us to do all these things. And we can't endure it, we can't bear it, so we're forced to follow this, this instinct, spending all kinds of money on all kinds of things. Women especially have put all kinds of effort into the instinct of showing off. And even this instinct, the funniest, the most amusing instinct of all, it's People don't even, they spend all their money trying to satisfy this instinct, following this instinct. But even so, this, this craziest, silliest instinct of all is still a prison. Think about it, if, if we made an account, there are, are of people, of our expenses, there are many people who spend more money on decorating and ornamenting themselves, painting themselves up, buying fancy clothes to make themselves beautiful. They spend even more money on this than on food, which is something necessary for life. 
and decorating and, and prettying up our, our houses, which is not a necessary thing, but how much money do we put into, into these things? There are many people who put far more money into, these, into this decoration and ornamentation in order to show off than if they put into the necessities of life, like food. And this, this is how this, this instinct is a prison, forcing us to do such a foolish thing. And now we come to the most amusing pr prison that we've come to so far, or the prison that's the closest to us, the closest to home. This is the prison of the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. You'll have to listen carefully in order to understand how the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind become a prison. In Pali, we call these things, the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind, we call them the ayatana, ayatana. The ayatana, this word literally means tools or mechanisms for, for communicating with the external world. Mechanisms, means for, for contacting, for associating with the external world. In Sanskrit, it's the same, ayatana. In English, it's not so easy. Maybe we'll try the word media, media, the sense media, as the means for communication with the external world, or in Pali, the ayatana. When there is upadana in life, and life which has these six media for experiencing, for for being aware, for, for tasting, for drinking life. Life is experienced, is, is tasted through these six media. And so when there is upadana in these six media, the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind, then we, we become servants. We turn our life into serv a servant of the media, the ayatana. And so we serve the eyes to make the eyes happy and delighted. We serve the ears. We become the servants of the nose and the tongue in order to delight these sense media. We become a servant of the skin, the body, the body sense, and a servant of the, the mental sense. And in this way, all our behavior is turned into service in order to delight and please these six ayatana, the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. And then in this way, it becomes a prison, this, this service, this being a servant of, a slave to these ayatana, these sense media, becomes a prison. All the kinds of entertainment we seek is just to serve the six ayatana. Are there any of you out there who are not servants, are not slaves to the ear, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind? Is there any life out there that is not a slave to these things that have not been imprisoned by them. Because we, we, put, we spend so much of our energy and time in service of the, these media, trying to make the, the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind happy, to make them comfortable, to entertain and amuse these senses. This is why we say that we are, are slaves to them. Are there any of you who are not such slaves? 
So the foolish person, the wise person, is not a slave to the ayatana, whereas the person who is not awoken is still enslaved and most willingly is a slave to these sense media. Through the, through the correct practice of mindfulness with breathing, we will be released from the prison. But if we don't practice anapanasati correctly and completely, then we will remain slaves to the ayatana forever. The next prison we would like to talk about is the one that goes under the name in Thai, Sayasa, which we can often translate as superstitious formalities or superstitious beliefs and behaviors. Sat means science or a kind of knowledge. Saya means to sleep. Sayasat or superstition is the science of sleepers or the sleeping science, which is just a kind of pseudoscience. Sayasat is being, nowadays, isn't as much of a problem because of developments in, in science. Science has come to understand nature much more clearly, and so this has helped to lessen superstitions. But still, there are superstitions remaining in all of us. In some people, there, are very mu- there is a lot of sayasat, whereas in others, there's not so much sayasat. But whether a lot or a little, sayasat, this pseudoscience of sleepers, is a prison. Although, in general, this science of sleepers has diminished due to the progress of science, there is still quite a bit of sayasa left. Please, please accept our apologies. Please forgive us for saying so. And the place where we can find superstition the most is in church or in the temple or these kinds of places where there are altars and where people <coughs> bow down in worship so-called sacred and holy things. Wherever we ha- find these churches and temples and, and shrines and things, this is where we find the most sayasat these days. Sayasat is a, something that we are often taught as children before we have any wisdom and where people can tell us things without having to make any sense or to prove them at all. Because as children we believe whatever we're told. And so we're taught many, many things as children and then cling to these superstitions. For example, are there any of you who feel that 13 is an unlucky number. That's just one example of of sayasat. There are many other examples of superstition, but we we better not go into them. People might get offended. If we look though at these instances of sayasat, then we'll see that they are a prison. The next item we'd like to talk about are those institutions or establishments which are well-known, famous, celebrated, with that people honor, that sometimes people even consider sacred and holy. There are a number of these, these places, establishments, institutions, or associations around the world that people become members of. People willingly 
join up some club or organization or establishment and then cling and grasp to this this organization or institution and they, they take up an egoistic attitude towards it and think that I'm, I'm better, I'm superior because I belong to such and such. I'm a member of such and such club or organization or temple or religion. And then one gets superior ideas. This becomes a prison as soon as we we take this attitude, these things become prisons. So be very careful about these institutions and establishments and churches and temples and what have you. Especially, please don't don't think that Suan Mok is such a place or a thing. Don't get the idea that Suan Mok is some holy sacred place that we must sign up and join without examining and clearly evaluating and critically analyzing what is taking place. People who are joining these, these clubs and institutions all the time have no critical perspective. They don't look into things carefully. But for Su and Mok, you don't have to join up or, or get or cling to the place. It's okay to take a careful look at things, to examine the situation. Please don't turn Su and Mok into a prison. Please don't, don't make this into a trap. The next prison is called teacher or ajan. Teacher will say guru. The next prison is guru. In all, all over the place, there are all these gurus. There's the the guru of Burma and the guru of Sri Lanka and Thailand and and Tibet and China. In every country there's the big guru or in each region there's the big teacher and in each province and in each district and each area and each village they've got someone who is held to be the big teacher, the guru. And then people cling and clutch at the, this guru and the guru's teachings. And they, they, <clears throat> they hold that only this guru is correct, only this teacher is right, and all the other teachers, all the other gurus are completely wrong. And people get trapped. They, they cling on to and hang on to their guru and get trapped by him or her. And they don't they have no critical ability. They don't look and see what is actually true. They don't see for themselves. They don't analyze <clears throat> and know for themselves. And so they turn the teacher, the guru, into a prison. Please don't do this. Whether it's a big prison or a small prison, please don't turn any teacher or guru into your prison. The next prison is that of sacred scriptures. They've got these things called sacred or holy scriptures all, all around. In any area or among any group where there's not much wisdom, then they really are hanging on to things that they call <coughs> sacred scriptures, these <coughs> sacred texts, holy books. And they, they cling so much to the supposed holiness of the books, they, they even think it's a representative of, of God. And then put so much, put so much stress on this, the physical sacred book that then it, it has influence, it gives rise or it spawns all kinds of other holy things like holy water, holy chants, holy this, holy that, and all kinds of 
holy things. This is holiness or sacredness that arises out of upadana, upadana or upatan. And all these sacred scriptures and things become a prison. Please don't get trapped by these prisons of, of sacred things. You ought to know that there's the most sacred thing of all is the law of itapajayada, the law of conditionality or causality. This, this law is sacred without there being any upadana. The other things aren't really sacred. We make them sacred with our upadana. But the law of causality is sacred within itself. There's nothing higher than this. It's, it's really sacred. It's actually sacred without us having to have any upadana towards it. So we ought to know this law of causality, the law of conditionality, and, and have, if we want something sacred, instead of making up these other kinds of sacred things, which is just a kind of self-hypnosis. Be very careful about this, this kind of prison. And now the next prison is one that is very, very important, one that causes all sorts of problems. This is the prison of goodness, the prison of the good. There are all kinds of things that we take to be good, that we take to be goodness. We're all very interested in good things, in having good things, in getting good things. We give a lot of importance to what is good. But as soon as there is upadana in these good things or in goodness, then that goodness becomes a prison. We get go crazy about goodness. We're drunk on goodness. We'll get lost in goodness because of upadana towards the good, towards good things. Now, if there's just goodness without the upadana, then there's no prison. But as soon as there arises upadana, the goodness becomes a trap, becomes a prison for us. So let there just be goodness. Let there just be good things without going crazy and getting drunk and lost in upadana towards these things. And then there won't be a prison of goodness. But all of us are really, really infatuated with goodness. And so all of us have turned the good and good things into our prison. Those of you who are Christians, we ask you to, to think back to the teachings on the, in the first book, the first chapter of, of Genesis, the, the, the part of the Bible that talks about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, where God told Adam and Eve to not, where God forbid Adam and Eve to eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But Adam and Eve didn't listen. They went and ate that fruit, and that led to their being able to discriminate between goodness and evilness. And from this discrimination there arose upadana towards goodness and evil, and then good and evil became prisons. A true Christian would understand this teaching and practice it, and so would not make good and evil into any, any prison. This teaching is very profound. It's very intelligent and wise, but nobody seems to understand it. And so people don't understand that good and evil are not to be clung to with upadana. If we do, then they become prisons. If you understand this story, then you will be able to 
apply its very profound meaning and not make good and evil into prison out of upadana. When one goes and eats the fruit of that tree, then it becomes what is called original sin or sometimes perpetual sin. This upadana in good and evil becomes original prison or perpetual prison. Please be very careful. Beware of this matter and don't don't get caught in that original prison, that perpetual prison. Please, please don't let yourself get caught. If there is upadana in the good, if goodness is made into a prison, then there will be a, a searching for the supreme good. And that thing, that supreme good, the highest good, the pinnacle of all goodness, will become the supreme prison. And if this is our meaning of God, that God is the supreme good, then God will become a prison, will become the supreme prison through this upadana. Please be very careful about this. The next prison is that of our own views and opinions, our personal views and opinions. The Pali word is Titi. Titi can, is often translated views and opinions. But this includes not just our little petty views, our little opinions, but includes all ideas, theories, opinions, beliefs, perspectives, all these, all these titi that we call our own, all these personal thoughts and opinions and views, theories and beliefs. These titi are a very horrible prison because when <clears throat> all we do is listen to our own views and ideas and thoughts and beliefs, we don't listen to the truth. We, we turn our back to the things that can truly benefit us because we're, our minds are closed and our, I, we only follow our own ideas, beliefs, and views. We turn our back to what is truly beneficial, what is truly of value to us. And so these views become a terrible prison that is holding us and chaining us and preventing us from realizing what, what is truly beneficial for us. Be very careful of these TT. The next prison, which is a really strange and marvelous prison, we could call it the the highest prison is what we could call innocence or or purity, pureness, purity. This is a a prison that people are making a great big deal about. We hear all kinds of talk about innocence, of purity, but people never seem to know what they're they're talking about. This is a kind of purity that want people dream up on their own. It's a purity that comes out of upadana, the purity of taking this kind of bath or doing a ceremony where we get holy something rubbed on our, our foreheads or sprinkled on us. We get holy spells chanted over us, various things done to purify us. This kind of purification, this kind of innocence, is the purity of through upadana, which is not real purity. If there is upadana towards the purity, towards the innocence, then it's not really pure. The more we are clinging to ourselves, to our ideas about ourselves, to I, 
and mind, then the more there is clinging and hanging on to purity with upadana, the more we're stuck in ourselves, the more we'll be stuck in impurity. And so there's, there's these ideas and ceremonies and practices in order to purify ourselves, in order to purify our, our souls, to become pure, in order to, through this, this purity, to become an eternal soul that is eternally pure. But this purity through upadana is a prison. And so that eternal soul is really an eternal prison. This highest prison is one that we ought to watch out for. This, this prison of, of purity. Regarding this, this last prison, we'd like to say that genuine purity, true purity, is the purity of voidness, of being void of any, any sense, any ideas, any notions about I and mine, about self. To be void of self, to, this is the truest purity, this voidness. If, if in purity, if there's some idea of I who is pure, or my purity, if there's any, any notion or sense or feeling of that purity being a self or a soul, then that is not true purity. Voidness is a purity that is seen as not self, not soul. This, this is true purity, the purity of voidness. This purity is not a prison. All the prisons that we have mentioned so far, all of these prisons can be come down to the prison of atta, the prison of self. Every kind of possible prison is nothing but the prison of self, the prison of I in mind. In Pali, this word is atta, Sanskrit atman, thai dua eng, English self or myself or oneself, whatever. Any any sense, any belief, any idea of their, of something being I or mine, being self, or of it belonging to self. This upadana in things, this, this atta, this self, is, is the, the true prison. If you practice anapanasati correctly, and if you realize true success in anapanasati, remember we're talking about true success, not some success we make up on our own or some success through upadana. But if true success in anapanasati will destroy, will free us, will remove this ultimate prison of self, and then this, this prison will disappear and we won't build such a prison or any prison anymore if we practice correctly and realize the true and realize true success in mindfulness with breathing. Through correctly realizing success, true success in anapanasati, Atta, self, will be removed. And when self is removed, this is the meaning of salvation, of liberation. This is the true goal, the true aim of anapanasati, 
to liberation from Atta. All religions have this, the goal of emancipation, of salvation, deliverance, relief, whatever we call it. And the meaning of this is to be released, to be liberated from self, from the self of upadana, from the self that arises through upadana. Anapanasati, if done correctly, leads to this release, this liberation, this emancipation from Atta. I myself have been trying my best and willing to do whatever I can to help everyone to understand how, what Anapanasati is and how to use Anapanasati to, to realize this liberation from prison, this emancipation, in order that all of us, all of us can escape from the prison of humanity. And on this, and so we, may we now end today's talk.